Good afternoon and welcome to the Common Avenue Baptist Church Wednesday 1.30 Bible study. My name is Minister Cynthia Wizu, and I, I am an associate minister at Convent and I wanna welcome you this afternoon. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, I'd like to thank our senior pastor, the Reverend Dr. Jesse T. Williams uh, Jr. and our uh, Minister of Christian Education, Reverend Dr. Charlene Faison for allowing me the opportunity to uh, facilitate today's study of God's word. So let's begin with some prayer. Our Lord and our God, we do praise you and we thank you, dear God. You are wonderful and you're great, dear God. And we thank you, dear Lord, for this opp opportunity to gather in this virtual space, dear Lord. And though we are virtual, we know that you are present and we welcome your presence here as we look at your word. We pray that you will illuminate your word uh, to us, dear God. And we pray, dear Lord, for the movement of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, dear Lord, that we will be moved, dear God, by your word to change and to be transformed and to be more like Christ. Father, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, during this Lenten season, we have been studying various spiritual disciplines and practices that we can engage in to foster and develop and grow ourselves spiritually um, because, you know, um, our spiritual growth so that the salvation that we as Christians experience is not a one-time event, but that salvation is life. So it's ongoing, it's life. It's not just, oh, okay, I, I got saved in 1985. It is ongoing. And so a part of growing into our salvation and developing it to, into that is just disciplines disciplines. And so uh, full participation in the life of God's kingdom and in the rich companionship of Jesus Christ, it comes to us only through the appropriate exercise in the discipline for life in the spirit. And so just like we, when we exercise on uh, walking, running, using weights or what have you, constant exercise, we start to see our bodies change. The same thing happens when we do our spiritual disciplines and exercises or practices. So far, we have studied uh, the disciplines of prayer, fasting, the study of God's word and worship. Today, we will explore the discipline of forgiveness. Forgiveness is a tough one. It's you know, one person said it's probably the hardest of all disciplines to forgive because it's not something that comes naturally. You know, there are approximately 125 direct references, references to forgiveness in the Bible, and almost all of the Bible uh, pictures of forgiveness are pictures of divine forgiveness. But on a human level, we have several that we can look at. So I'm just going to share my screen and we're going to take a look at that and look at those. Hopefully you can see that. So just some examples of forgiveness that we see in the Bible um, between humans. Uh, we see Joseph's forgiveness of his villainous brothers, Esau's forgiveness of Jacob, his twin brother, Jacob. Uh, Jesus commands that people forgive their fellow humans. How many times? 70 times seven in Matthew 18, 22 and Luke 17 and four. There's also the parable involving canceling, the canceling of debts. That's also found in the math, in the book of Matthew chapter 18. And we're going to be looking at that scripture today. And then there's God's forgiving people as they forgive others. We, those of us who pray the, what we call the Lord's prayer, uh, you know, um, we ask the Lord to forgive us our debts as you, as we forgive our debtors. And so um, we're asking God, God's, God's forgiving, forgiving people as they forgive others. And then there's the parable of the prodigal son and the forgiving father is a picture of human forgiveness, but also a metaphor of God's forgiveness and found in Luke 15. But this today we're going to kick off with the scripture that's found in Matthew chapter 18 to 21, excuse me, chapter 18, 21 through 35. I'll be reading from the New King James Version, and we're going to be looking at the parable of the unforgiving servant 
to kind of give us some insight this afternoon about uh, forgiveness. So we see the first two verses uh, of our reading, uh, verses 21 and 22, it says that, then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. You know, rabbinical tradition taught that a brother would be forgiven three times for the same offense, but not four times. So Peter is trying to be a better than superior law keeper. Uh, and so he doubled the number and added one and came up with seven times. And he didn't probably, he didn't get the answer that he expected or the response uh, that he anticipated. Uh, he probably anticipated a congratulations uh, 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 for, from Jesus, but instead he got correction from Jesus. And Jesus teaches us that believers uh, in Christ have been forgiven far more than times than they will ever be asked to forgive someone. So we must cultivate a spirit of forgiveness not a habit of committing offenses. So what Jesus is suggesting here by this answer he gives to Peter, that forgiveness has no limits, that we continue to forgive. And that's a hard nut to crack sometime or, to, or hard, it's hard to swallow that, that we are to continue to forgive unlimitedly, unlimitedly or uh, without limits. <laughs> and so, so let's continue to read about the parable of the unforgiving servant. Picking up in verse 23, it says, therefore, the king of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he began to settle accounts, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But as he was not able to pay his master, uh, commanded, but as he was not able to pay, sorry, his, com his master commanded that he he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have mercy with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owned, who owned uh, him a hundred denarii, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, pay me what you owe. He, I could see him, he took him, pay me what you owe. <laughs> so his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him saying, have mercy with me and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and they came and they told their master all that had been done. done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to who? to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Now this is the red letter, this is Jesus words. So shall my father, my heavenly father also do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. So we see a couple of things going on here in this text. First of all, we see that, um, in other words, we have to forgive. We, ha in a, we have to forgive, and I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong page here. Here we go. <laughs> in this parable, we see a servant who having been forgiven a debt uh, that some might estimate at $8 billion today, he refused to forgive a debt of 20,000 which clearly is a drop in the bu bucket. $20,000 is a lot of money, especially if you don't have it. And even if you do have it, but compared to 8 billion, it's, there's no comparison. Jesus wants us to see the unreasonableness 
of the servant who had been forgiven an enormous debt in refusing to forgive the debt that was owed to him. It's also important, and, and, and I would just say that's just the way we are. The debt that Jesus has forgiven us for, uh, there's no work. There was no way we can work to achieve what we needed to pay the debt that we owe Jesus, that we owe God. We can't pay it. Um, and so what he paid and what he has forgiven us for, um, you know, it's a, it, it, when somebody uh, offends us, or trespasses against us, it's a drop in the bucket compared to what God has forgiven us for and continues to forgive us for. It's also important to know what happens to the unforgiving servant. He is delivered to the torturers. Unforgiveness hurts us. It harms us physically, emotionally, and mentally. And so, uh, uh, so it's something to be mindful here. So, so we have to look at what is this forgiveness? What is forgiveness? To forgive is to remit, to settle or cancel. Uh, can, in this case, is a debt. You know, we cancel the debt in our parable, but also we see through scriptures where uh, forgiveness is uh, um, we are canceling or settling uh, a sins. And we have a number of scriptures of that. And the person who's doing that, of course, is God. Uh, the verb here is uh, signifies the remission of the punishment due to sinful conduct, the deliverance of the sinner from the penalty, divinely and therefore righteously imposed. So it also involves the co complete removal of the cause of offense. Such remission is based upon a sub substitutional and conciliatory sacrifice of Christ. So we see human forgiveness is to be strictly analogous to divine forgiveness. So in other words, we forgive because God, through Jesus Christ, forgives us. Forgiveness doesn't spring from any human good works, and it isn't the result of our own endeavors to be gracious and forgiving towards others. Rather, it comes from the grace of God. We don't have it in us to forgive the way God calls us to give, forgive. And that's part of the fallen nature that we're in. We just don't have it in us. But because of God's grace, that allows us to forgive others. In our scripture, our debt to God is infinitely greater than our brother's or sister's debt to us. And recognizing the positions, that positions, um, recognizing that, but it positions us to receive from God the very thing that others desire from us, and that is mercy. That is mercy. So, so what does this mean for us? Forgiveness is an act of love. Love forgives. And you know, we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we call it the love chapter, and we see what love does. And what love does, we find in the latter part of verse 5, is love forgives. Um, forgiveness is a decision. Uh, you know, we, we want to reality, reta retaliate, but we choose not to. And then forgiveness is a, a spiritual, oh, excuse me, also in addition to uh, um, forgiveness being a decision, um, our capa capacity to forgive does not depend on anyone else's behavior or permission. So the person can ask for forgiveness or not. They can continue to be offensive toward us or not. We are called to make a decision to forgive. And that's what makes forgiveness difficult and challenging. Forgiveness is also a spiritual act, which means that ultimately I rely on God, on God's grace to accomplish it. We have to rely on God to accomplish it because um, we can't do it in and of ourselves. And then forgiveness is a private and ongoing discipline of mind heart and soul. It's something we have to work at. It's something we have to practice. So that's what forgiveness is, but I think we need to take a look at what forgiveness is not. And I think we may get freed up by looking at what forgiveness is not, because we've added a lot of stuff to what forgiveness is. You know, we were often say, oh, you have to forgive and forget, but that not that's not necessarily the case. I got this piece from, uh, it's taken for what's 
from what forgiveness is not five common misconceptions by Laura Petherbridge. And first of all, forgiveness is not a feeling. Forgiveness is an act of obedience to God stemming from gratitude for his grace. And God knows that revenge and anger and rage can destroy us spiritually, emotionally, and physically. Christ paid too much for this beloved ones to have them, or too much for his beloved ones, to have them be slaves to anything, particularly hatred. And that's what happens when we allow unforgiveness to sit in our heart. It starts to torture us. And so it's not a feeling. We have to make a decision. It's an act of obedience. Forgiveness is not pretending you're not hurt either. You know, you're not walking around with a painted uh, paint on, smile when you're seething inside. Um, it, that's not forgiveness. In scripture, we never see Jesus pretend. He doesn't pretend. When he is sad, he cried in John eleven thirty-five. 35. When he was angry, he turned over the tables in the temple. Someone has betrayed your trust. They've damaged your soul or caused the loss. It is okay to recognize and feel the hurt instigated by another person's behavior. You're not supposed to just sweep it under the rug. Feel your feelings. Uh, and forgiveness is not condoning what the person did to you either. Um, we, uh, many people hesitate to forgive because they feel as though the wrongdoer is getting away with the offense or that forgiveness will somehow condone the offender's choices. It does not. Instead, forgiveness real releases the wrongdoer from the debt she owes you, and it releases you from your bitterness. So, so they're not off the hook. What they did is wrong. Uh, if they did something wrong, it is wrong. Uh, this is what uh, Corinthians talks about in chapter 13 also about how, Lord, how love celebrates the truth. Um, and, and, and so it's about the truth in the matter. And if this person hurt you, uh, you know, they have to, it's not like it, it just, just, just doesn't disappear. Um, yeah, you know, and you're not condoning what they did. What they did was wrong, but we have to do, we, we have to do release them from uh, the debt that they owe us and from the bitterness that may develop in our heart. Forgiveness is not trusting the offender either. Uh, we think that we have to be buddy, buddy with this person. No. After a betrayal, trust is not an automatic right of the offender. Forgiveness does not mean you immediately allow the person back into your life or heart. If someone is repentant and willing to work on restoring the relationship, you might be able to trust him again eventually. However, sometimes those who wound us shouldn't be trusted again. Though forgiveness should not be contingent on that perpetrator's repentance, a truly repentant person doesn't demand forgiveness or misuse Bible verses in an attempt to make you feel guilty. He humbly accepts complete responsibility for the sin and the consequences for his actions, which may include giving you time to see evidence of his or her trustworthiness. So forgiveness does not mean uh, <clears throat> you trusting the offender. Um, and it doesn't mean you go back to relationship business as usual. Um, it, it means that relationship will probably change based on the offense that has taken place because you can't go back because something has changed. The dynamic has changed. Forgiveness is not relieving the person of responsibility either. A person shouldn't be off the hook from his or her responsibilities just because you choose to forgive. For example, uh, a wife may be forgiven for her placing the family in financial ruin with debt, but she should still be responsible for paying off the debt. Uh, or that could be a child for that matter, or you know, uh, uh, another family member that's living in the household. Uh, a former husband may be forgiven for destroying his marriage with an affair, but he should still pay child support to his former wife. Forgiveness doesn't eradicate responsibility. <clears throat> It's not unloving to hold someone accountable. If you lost your child to a murder, you may get to the point to forgive that person, but that does not mean they, 
you, they do not pay the price for their crime. Often accountability is the most loving thing you can do because it could lead to repentance on the part of that person. So uh, I hope, you know, I, when I went through this, I thought this was so freeing because we have attached so much to what forgiveness is, is but we see that it's not feeling, it's not pretending you're, you were not hurt. It's not condoning what the person did to you. It's not trusting the offender. It's not relieving the person of responsibility. Forgiveness is a process and it can be a process. Forgiveness, uh, releasing resentment and pardoning uh, a person, uh, someone who has offended you or hurt you is rarely a one-time event. The pain doesn't necessarily just poof, disappears like that for, uh, once you forgive someone. And those closest to us may hurt us repeatedly, requiring us to forgive multiple times and also make some adjustments to how our relationship with that person. It can take weeks, months, or even years to give certain hurts done to us. The deeper the relational investment, the deeper the wound. Many leaders in the church, they know the painful, slow, often agonizing process of forgiving. It's tempting to uh, ignore the discipline of forgiving because you have to work at it at times, especially when you have so much else to do. Uh, a friend of mine who is a psychologist, she said, when we forgive, we do not necessarily forget. Rather, we open the door for our emotional and spiritual healing. So forgiveness is a process. Forgiveness is self-care, you know, uh, bringing healing to ourselves as we let go and release people. So forgiveness is a process. So my question to you today is whom do you need to forgive today? Is it a family member, uh, a friend, an enemy, a work colleague? Maybe it's someone who has died that you can't even talk to. Uh, it may be someone you don't know. It might be somebody in the news. It could be a politician. It could be someone you don't know personally, but they've offended you by how they've acted, what they've done. We can look at back at history, at, at offenses, at uh, the offense of group of people, groups of people. Are we holding unforgiveness there? It's interesting. We have to allow the Holy Spirit to search us because it's amazing uh, the, uh, the areas and the hiding places where unforgiveness can reside in our heart. Um, so it's not just the people who are up close in front of us. It could be people we don't know. We hear a story and we're holding a grudge against someone we don't even know, but we see what they're doing. Well, today we're going to uh, think about that and we're going to approach the Lord in prayer to ask him who, um, who should, who ask the Lord to bring to mind, who do we need to forgive? And so um, let's pray. Our Lord and our God, we do praise you and we thank you for your word, dear God, and clarity on forgiveness, dear God, and clarity on unforgiveness, dear Lord, how it can weigh us down. We ask, oh Lord, that as we look at your word today and we are here, we want you to search us, Lord. Search our hearts and minds as we uh, uh, are praying now and even as we, uh, throughout the rest of the day and the rest of the week, bring to mind where we need to seek forgiveness in our lives, dear God. Uh, what unforgiveness might be lying with, uh, within us, dear God, uh, with people we know and people we don't even know personally, dear God. What hurts uh, uh, are still there, dear God, that are tied to unforgiveness, dear Lord. We ask that you would bring them to the surface, dear God. And we pray, dear God, uh, that... Um, we recognize, dear Lord, that we need our own forgiveness, dear God. Uh, and we, we want to be honest with you, Lord, dear Father, and we want you to reveal any distorted thinking we may have about forgiveness, dear Lord, correct our thinking about forgiveness, dear Lord. And um, that we will understand the difference between what forgiveness is and what it's not, dear Lord. Father, we do praise you and we thank you and we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. So uh, my brothers and sisters, my uh, 130 
uh, Wednesday family. That's the word on forgiveness. Uh, I hope it, uh, you found it helpful and um, that you will continue on our journey in terms of uh, disciplines, that you will make it a discipline in your life to a practice to forgive, uh, especially every time we may pray on Sunday, uh, the Lord's prayer or the disciples pray, the Lord's models prayer, where we say, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. May a bell go off in our hearts, in our minds that, you know, that we need to practice forgiveness and practice daily. Amen. All right. Well, next week we have coming up. Uh, let's see. Let me just check the schedule. We have uh, giving coming up, the discipline of giving, and that will be led by Minister Richard Spivey. Amen. It's good seeing you um, today and uh, good to be seen. And uh, may the Lord bless you and keep you uh, throughout the rest of the week. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>